Tom Joel. Not Joel, but Joel. Verses. We're going to look at uh, here's what's going on in Israel. Verses one, uh, four, and five. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. As you just heard, the nation of Israel is in trouble. They are under the constant pursuit of their enemies. They have experienced a terrible drought. They have had a massive invasion of locusts. These tragedies left the land ruined and the people demoralized. The prophet Joel uses these events to illustrate God's judgment upon Israel. Their specific sin is not mentioned. But careful reading of the book of Joel indicated that the people had slipped into complacency and apathy about the things of God. God uses nature and the enemies as his means to, of divine judgment upon Israel. He uses the trials they face as a nation to awaken their hearts and his people and call them back to them. This book of Joel is a book of judgment. But it is also a book of hope. In this book, God's people are made to understand that even in the midst of divine judgment, there is always hope that they will seek the Lord. The book of Joel deals with Israel's past, but it also looks forward to its glorious day when they will enjoy the great blessings of God. While the book of Joel uh, was written to the people of Israel, there's something in it for us as well. Like Israel, we are on the land under divine judgment. We look at our nation, we look at the world, and we wonder, is there any hope for our future? We wonder if there's any hope for real revival. We wonder if there are any promises in these dark days. We wonder if we are living in the days of Noah, or in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what's going on in our nation today. Our forefathers had to be turning over in their graves. Natural disasters with our nation. Riots everywhere. Looting everywhere. Killings everywhere. All because we have taken God out of everything. Until we put God back into our schools, our churches, and we turn this nation back to God, nothing's going to change. No one can tell me that we're not living in a generation that calls evil good and good evil. Because if you go to uh, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. We're living in a society that protects the wicked and punishes the righteous. We are living in a world that fear has replaced faith. We are, sin has replaced uh, living godly lives. Greed has replaced God, and hatred has replaced love. There's no doubt in my mind that America is under an awesome judgment of God today. We can see it in our homes. We can see it in our streets. We can see it in our entertainment. We can see it. Our, preachers, our preaching is being watered down Holiness has given away to happiness. Complacency has been given away to complacency. We have people in the pews, but our altars are empty. We get more excited about a shopping trip than we do about a revival meeting. We weak in sin and wince at the holy demands of God. We have lost our fire. We have lost our power. We have lost our desire for the things of God. We'd rather play than pray. We would rather have our, eye, our ears tickled that our hearts searched by the word of God. We would rather be entertained than challenged. We would rather stay the way we are instead of becoming like him. You better believe me that this nation 
is under the judgment of God. That's why our nation is in the shape it is today. That's why our churches are in the shape they are in today. That's why we're experiencing a spiritual drought. Then we wonder why our young people have little desire for the Lord. And the only thing that will change this situation, and I know what wants to hear this, but it's genuine repentance. God is not looking for more external displays of religion. He's looking for changed hearts. He's looking for people who are broken over their sin and are willing to change. He's looking for people who will be sorrowful over their sins. He's looking for people who are honest. He's looking for people who are open to repentance. God is looking for people that he can bless today. However, his blessings are only for those who will be willingly and honest about the condition and he'll, who, who deal with their sins his way. Those who are willing to face the fact with weeping and mourning over their sins. These are the kind of people that God will bless and restore because in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses their sins and renounces them finds mercy. In 1 John 1, 19, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We live in a generation that puts everything ahead of God. The only hope our nation has of being saved from judgment is for God's people to seek the Lord. Until we are God's, until we, we as God's people repent, there'll be no power, there'll be no glory, there'll be no hope for our nation, there'll be no hope for our churches, as long as the churches continue to walk in rebellion against God. The world mocks us, they mock our God. See, God is looking for restoration. God is calling his people from the oldest to the youngest to come back to him. He's calling spiritual leaders of the people to come back to him. He wants his people to seek his face again. He wants people to get hungry for him one more time. And the verses I'm about to read remind us that there is hope. And what our God, and with our God, it is never too late. If you go to Job chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, It says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to your Lord, your God, for his gracious and compassion, slow in anger and abandoning in love. He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offering and drink offering for the Lord your God. Then over in uh, 18, then the Lord was jealous for his man. He took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending new grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. And then over in verse uh, 223, be glad, people of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for has given you the autumn rains. Because he is faithful, he sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floor will be filled with grain, the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts have, the, the great locusts, I will replace what the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarms. My great army, I will send among you, and you will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord, your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then they will know that I am, the, I am in Israel, that I am the Lord, your God, and that there is no other, never again, will my people, people be shamed. See, after discussing the problem, the Lord now promises to deliver them from their enemies. 
He promises to feed them, bless them, and satisfy them one more time. There is not a saved person in this room that doesn't look for God's blessings on his people again. For him to deliver us from our enemies. For him to feed us again. God promised that everything that has been lost will be replaced. That's what we need in our day. We need the Lord to open up the windows of heaven and erase the spiritual drought that we have been living in. We need him to send the heavenly rains upon us one more time. We need him to give us back everything the enemy has tried to take away. We need a revival of his presence. We need a revival of his power in our services. We need a revival of the conviction of God for the lost. That's the only hope we have for our families, our communities, and our churches in our nation today. I could be wrong, but I believe that God will, the church will experience one more revival before the Lord comes. I believe that God still has a remnant of people out there who love him more than they love their sins. I believe God is going to purify his church, and when he does, there'll be no doubt who's in control. And there'll be no doubt who is to be worshipped and glorified. For the, even the enemies of the church will know and acknowledge that God walks among his people. The world looks at us and they laugh. They say we're weak. They say that we are out of touch with modern ideas. They tell us that we need to turn loose of our outdated superstitious beliefs. That we need, <coughs> excuse me, they say we need to forget about the Bible. They say we need to forget about preaching Jesus as the only hope of our salvation. They say we are foolish idiots who need religion because we are unable to deal with life. They say we need a crutch to make it day by day. They're right about one thing. Jesus is a crutch. And I'm too crippled to walk even one step on my own without him. But they're wrong about the rest. Because when this thing ends, the church is going up in the world and its outdated values is going down. And when God comes back, he'll make his presence known. In uh, Mark 2, 1, it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And God is coming home. And what a day that will be. See, it's never too late. There is still time to save our churches. There's still time to save that next generation. There's still time to turn this nation back to God. We can't do it on our own. We need God to move one more time among his people if we're going to see the revival that we need. We're going to change our ways. We're going to have to wake up, clean up, and get back to God. And, and I believe that Paul's words to Romans to the Romans in Romans 13, 11 through uh, 14, sum it all up. And do this, understand the present time. The hour has come and is already for you to wake up from your slumber because your salvation is near now than when you first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let's put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us be, uh, behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing, drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And I do believe that we are living in the last days. Amen. And I do believe that when he comes back, there's going to be fear, there's going to be trembling. And there's going to be God, oh my God, what is going on? What has happened? But it's going to be too late for so many. And we have nobody to blame but ourselves. We become be so complacent. And putting church below everything else. And so, uh, it's my fault just as long as anybody else. We had them take prayer out of school. We didn't say a word. 
We're letting them take the crosses down everywhere. We didn't say a word. We let them take the Ten Commandments out of everything. We didn't say a word. Then we blame everybody else. We need to search our hearts. And if we're truly Christians, we're going to believe and stand up for what this country was founded on. One nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Let's pray. Father God, it is time for your churches to awaken. It's time for having a spiritual awakening, not only in this nation, but in the world. Everybody has their agenda. They can flaunt it day and night, but let us say something. And they try to shut us up. And I believe the reason they're trying to shut us up is because they don't want to see the light. They don't want to be exposed to their darkness. They don't want to be exposed to their sin. That's exactly what they're afraid of. And now, Father God, as we prepare to sing this closing hymn, I don't know when, if ever, the church will get back to normal. But you understand the situation. But what everybody forgets about is you're still in control of this world. And nothing happened, or is going to happen, shocks you off your throne. In Jesus' name, amen.